Cristiano Ronaldo is set to become the highest paid player in Premier League history following his uh, surprising return to Manchester United in the summer transfer window. Ronaldo will now become the highest earner the Premier League has ever seen. The forward will earn in excess of former Red Devil Alexis Sanchez's £560,000 a week contract. Well, the estimates are between four hundred and five hundred and fifty thousand. when taking into account bonuses and image rights. The Portuguese star's two-year contract with an option for an extra year also eclipses Rafael Varane's 400000 a week arrangement, which has seen him, had seen him, that's Varane, briefly become the highest earner uh, in the top flight. Joining us to discuss further is a Tunde Koiki sports analyst. Tunde, good morning to you. So, uh, we kick off with around Ronaldo here. The Glazers, the owners, already committed a hundred and twenty million pounds to signing Jaden Sancho and Varane from Dortmund and Madrid respectively. What does this fi this shock signing of Ronaldo do to Man United's finances? Uh, well, believe it or not, actually, uh, wrote his, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo actually took a pay cut to come to Manchester United. He actually used to earn like twenty six million pounds per annum over at Juventus, but he's not earning twenty million pounds from what we earn uh, for what we hear. Now that figure of five hundred thousand uh, pounds a week is not exactly true because when you factor in the fact that he'd be paying income tax, which for his tax bracket in the United Kingdom is more like. Uh, uh, probably like like forty five percent. He might end up end up earning more than like uh, three hundred and eighty five thousand pounds after tax, which is still quite a lot of money. Uh, and he'll be earning that. Uh, he'll still be the highest earner in the league and the highest earner in Manchester United. I think David De Gea was the former highest earner. He he earned three hundred and seventy six thousand uh, pounds a week. But everybody's talking about how can Manchester United afford to pay for this? Well, the truth is. Well, their, their wage bill has decreased somewhat because of the pandemic. Uh, they used to pay out like uh, $463 million, uh, $463 million uh, before. Now their wage bill has now reduced like uh, $396 million. Uh, so they've made some savings from that. Also, forget don't forget that match day revenue for Manchester United is the highest in the Premier League. Uh, their match day revenue is like $110 million. Uh, per season, which is the highest in the Premier League. So, and because of the pandemic and no people coming to the stadium last season, they weren't able to generate those amounts of money. But with the full stadiums back, everything going rightly for them, they can they can afford to to, to pay that, that amount of money to Cristiano Ronaldo. And his arrival has also generated tremendous, uh, uh, massive financial interest for Manchester United. Well, during just before he signed, Manchester United's uh, share price was trading at I think was it. Um, uh, seventeen thirty-eight dollars on the New York Stock Exchange. It jumped as high as nineteen oh nine, nineteen dollars uh, nine cents. That, but now I hear it's trading around like eighteen dollars and thirty right now. But it's still a tremendous amount of money. And we hear that even the the the, the market value, um, uh, the overall market value now has also increased by as much as uh, two hundred and ninety-five million dollars. So, which is really great for Manchester United on the financial front. Great stuff. Thank you so much uh, for recapping there. As far as the stock price for United on the on the New York Stock Exchange climbing, um, but I do want to ask you about um, a pressure to perform with salaries like this. Messi, I understand, is making about a million a week, uh, reportedly from uh, PSG. You've got Ronaldo here. I guess after taxes, three hundred and eighty-five thousand, uh, as you as you mentioned, is there. Is is the, I mean, do we not? Does anyone not question this because these are the two best players uh, in the world, or you know, is there is there pressure that comes along with these with these salaries? Sorry, I didn't get that. Could you repeat that? Yeah. So as far as pressure that comes with these salary, these high salaries, Messi, I understand making up about, about a million or so a week with with PSG or somewhere within that range. Maybe after taxes that comes down. But between him, Ronaldo here. Are there no questions asked when it comes to salaries like this because of the stature of the players? Absolutely, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of pressure. I mean, I mean, what you pay big money, you, you you expect big performances, and that's exactly what people like Paris Saint Germain are trying to do. Don't forget, they have never won the Champions, the UEFA Champions League before. They win the, the, the it's a default incentive for them to win the French league on. But they want to be counted as among Europe's elite, and the only way they can do that is to win the UEFA Champions League, and that's why they brought. A cheat code who is Lionel Messi. Man has won this trophy multiple times. So that's what they're trying to do. Uh, and for Lionel Messi, a man who has won six Ballon d'Ors, multiple uh, league titles with uh, Barcelona and La Liga, also won, recently won the Copa America uh, with uh, Argentina. He's a man who's used to pressure. But this is a different level because these people are paying a tremendous amount of money and they expect that he will deliver 
the holy grail for them. So these are players who are accustomed to living with this kind of pressure. But the question is, can they deliver? They're not as young as they used to be. Cristiano Ronaldo is 36. Messi is 34. They are not the explosive players that they used to be. Basically, um, why are they are more like ambush predators now. They're not like the maze runners of old who you slalom through defenses, uh, taking on five or six players. More like ambush predators who conserve their energy and pounce when it's necessary. Can they deliver? It remains to be seen. Thank you so much for that. Today, I want to move over to the NBA and this uh, vaccine mandate for staff that will be working near the players. Do you think that gets extended further out as uh, we go get closer to the NBA season? It's a distinct possibility. It's a distinct possibility because don't forget, these are multi-million dollar assets. That's the players themselves. And everything and anything that the NBA and the teams can do to protect these assets, they will do. Right now, this vaccine is extended to, um, like you right, like you said earlier on, uh, staff members, people in the front room, uh, coaches, uh, salary uh, members who are in constant contact with these players. And they've made it very clear that if you do not receive the vaccine, you cannot work, you cannot work within 15 feet of these players. That includes referees as well. So it's an all-encompassing program in short, you know, in order to protect these players. There is a possibility that might even be extended to, to fans in the stadiums as well. I've been hearing that, but I'm not sure. But don't forget, um, in, in the United States, they take uh, personal liberty very seriously. There are some people who do not want the vaccine, so you cannot exactly force them to. But there might come a point in the NBA where there, there might be uh, issues regarding if you do not get a vaccine, you cannot attend the NBA games. Interesting stuff. That's mm -hmm. going to be a very interesting development. Of course, considering that the, the teams badly need fans back in the stands. Um, I guess real quick, Djokovic signing with uh, Hublot, the luxury watchmaker, it seems yeah. like it's a first. Uh, well, well, what I have not much to say here, but what do you make of that? I guess uh, more is Hublot going to be targeting more players as play, tennis players? Okay, so Rafael uh, Rafa Nadal is signed to Richard Milley uh, as another luxury watchmaker, and uh, Roger Federer is signed to Rolex. So, um, Nova Djokovic was the la basically was the last <laughs> great player who didn't have the watch. And so, don't get, don't get me wrong, and this is prime real estate for a lot of these top players because when they're lifting the trophy, this is also particularly visible. So, it was a space race, an arms race in order to sign Nova Djokovic. Uh, who obviously have won that. So, it's, it's major marketing because when these players lift these trophies, this, the, the, the wristwatch, the wristwear is particularly visible, and that is why they're paying God knows how much. Uh, for for uh, Novak Djokovic, another take care of that space, but for uh, as is, as the luxury watchmakers are concerned, uh, Hubla have particularly over the moon to have signed the only player who remained unsigned, uh, the only big name player who remained unsigned for so long. All right, that completes the, the the trifecta, and all three of them, of course, on twenty Grand Slams. Each you'll see at the U.S. Open. Of course, Federer and Nadal not playing at the U.S. Open. Tunde Koiki, sports mm -hmm. analyst, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your insights.